Today, we will be recapping the recent MET inhibition in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer symposium from WCLC 2023 and highlighting the clinical pearls that were discussed at that event. This is CME on ReachMD, and I'm Dr. Paul Pack. Here with me today are Drs. Keith Kerr and Ross Kamage. Hi there. Hello. Let's get started with detecting MET gene aberrations. Dr. Kerr, can you please give us a brief overview of testing considerations for MetXon 14 skipping mutations? Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Paul, for the introduction. So MET exon 14 skipping mutations are one of the number of different aberrations that we can find in no small cell lung cancers, which may have clinical relevance. The other alterations are MET gene amplification and overexpression of the protein. The unusual location and the size of the mutations does lead to some problems with testing and identification of these mutations. Now, we're all used to using DNA and sequencing DNA, most likely in the context of a next-generation sequencing approach. And yes, sequencing DNA will work. Certainly, the hybrid capture type approaches of DNA sequencing are better than amplicon-based approaches for finding this kind of mutation. But this technology will miss some medics on 14 skipping mutations. It's actually better, the yield is better, if we use RNA sequencing, again, usually in the context of next generation sequencing. RNA sequencing appears to be better at picking up these alterations. It avoids some of the complications around the intronic involvement by the mutation and Rather like the success using RNA uh, with fusion genes, MEDXN14 skipping is better identified uh, using this particular technique. Now, tissue is definitely the preferred uh, medium for identifying these mutations, but you can also identify them in the blood. But there are issues, as we all know, about identifying any mutation that may be tumor-derived in the blood around issue, issues with sensitivity because of the huge dilutional effect that any mutant alleles might have uh, in the context of large amounts of DNA derived from non-tumor cells. So there is a sensitivity issue. And also bearing in mind what I just said about RNA being the preferred moiety, you can't really work with RNA in the blood. You're stuck with DNA. So you are going to miss even more, I guess of the mutations. But if you find one, it's good and it's fine and it's specific uh, for the purposes of treatment. It's just that tissue is better overall. Finally, though there are issues here around communication. It's really, really important that the lab knows that it's a MedX on 14 skipping mutation that the oncologist might be interested in rather than one of the other alterations. And finally, the lab needs to communicate in discussion with the oncologist around any MET mutation that is identified as to whether or not we predict it's likely to cause mutations. So overall, communication really important in this arena. So Keith, I appreciate the fact that uh, pathologists are mindful of sort of synthesizing that and communicating over the fact that it is an exon 14 skipping alteration uh, that's present depending on what's found in the, uh, the DNA. So next, uh, we need to move on to uh, to your presentation, Paul, which was uh, describing the key clinical trials and the data from them uh, around the use of MET inhibitors. Would you like to give us uh, uh, some of the highlights from that presentation? Oh, sure. So the presentation really was broken into, I think, three or four different parts. One of the parts was talking about the structure of the pivotal phase two trials that led to approval for MET inhibitors, particularly against MET exon 14 skipping. Uh, and then the second part was about the clinical efficacy data. The third part was about certain important safety signals, particularly, uh, particularly peripheral edema. And the fourth part, which was much more brief for the sake of time, had to do with taking a look at new emerging targets. And that really was MET amplification, both in a primary and acquired resistance setting. Um, most of the discussion was about the uh, FDA-approved indications for topotinib and catmatinib. So the studies that led to their approval were called vision and geometry, respectively. Uh, 
And they were fairly similar. They were both signal finding phase two non-randomized studies that were taking a look at overall response rate as a primary endpoint to really see what the signal of efficacy was in the population. Everyone had to have Medexon 14 skipping, though the way that this was detected differed between the two trials. For vision, both tissue and liquid biopsy detection were allowed. For the geometry study with catmatinib, it was only tissue or tumor testing detecting Medexon 14 skipping that was allowed. Tapotinib ended up treating over 300 patients in a couple of different cohorts that were essentially identical. Catmatib treated a bunch of patients, but parsed out by very specific lines of therapy cohort as the rehab. These would be things like cohort, you know, 5B47, which was reported. And I did present sort of the very specific details about the efficacy, but I think for this purpose, it's useful to say that if you take a look at the data, they're more similar than different. If you just lumped everything together, what you end up seeing is an overall response rate of between really sort of 50% to 60%, depending on the particular drug in the line of therapy. For both toponym and catmatinib, it did look like the efficacy was a bit higher in the 60% range in the frontline setting, a little bit lower for response rate in the second line setting and beyond. Median PFS overall was around 12 months. Median overall survival, importantly, was between 20 to 21 months for both drugs. So as it stands, very good efficacy data from both drugs, which led to line agnostic approvals for both in the United States. The other thing we talked about was that peripheral edema seemed to be somewhat of a unique side effect in terms of kinetics. It takes about two months on average for the edema to develop and can take quite a long time for it to resolve. And that in the end, it tends to be more like a lymphedema where drug cessation for upwards of four weeks, along with dose holds, are really the mainstays for management of the edema. Things like diuretics really don't work. And things like compression stockings and other lymphedema techniques have really mostly modest impact on the peripheral edema. The updates at WCLC 2023 for med inhibition really did focus on Insight 2, which took a look. It was a randomized study of osimertinib and tapotinib versus tapotinib as a monotherapy in patients with med amplified non-small lung cancer in the acquired resistance setting following treatment with a third generation TKI. And so there's been against this backdrop, a wealth of other information from TADN, et cetera, that suggests that this approach can be successful, things like safalitinib combined with osimertinib. And so this is a, a formal way to test efficacy in a randomized study uh, against a control arm of just tapotinib. And they were taking a look at overall response rate. One of the things to know about that I don't have to time to talk about, but there is a particular definition for main amplification that you'll have to take a look at because the, those definitions do change depending on what trial you're looking at. And those things can feed into the efficacy data. And what I'd say is that the update does sort of demonstrate and reaffirm the fact that it's an effective therapy, that the response rate was quite good in excess of 50%. But I think one of the key questions um, that the data raised, and I think maybe an issue from a regulatory standpoint, um, is how this uh, is perceived relative to what the standard of care might be. And in, in this case, the standard of care is chemotherapy. And so I think there's going to be some amount of discussion in the wake of this, uh, along with some other data as to where this fits um, within the setting of metamplified uh, lung cancer as an acquired resistance mechanism relative to chemotherapy and sort of how one positions these things. The other was a presentation taking a look at other biomarkers from the vision study to try to see if we could tease anything out with regards to resistance mechanisms and, and things along those lines. Some of the data are data that we had presented before when it came to the molecular characterization by liquid biopsy for responders and non-responders. But I think the more interesting part of this were some novel data that took a look at biomarkers in the blood. So these would be uh, taking a look at ligands like HGF, which is the ligand for MET in the blood, to see whether or not those dynamics played into sensitivity to med inhibition. And the takeaway message from that is that there did appear to be a signal that was there when it came to things like HGF ligand expression and resistance and sensitivity to therapy. So I think it's intriguing from a hypothesis uh, generating standpoint. I think the real trick here though is that we can't really do anything about these things, right? We don't have treatments that target ligands and um, it's not entirely clear um, how we might be able to take advantage of this. And I think it's also not clear, entirely clear as to whether or not we can use these biomarkers to stratify patients in terms of what they should receive. Um, so these updates were really, I think, um, important updates. They were very interesting updates. Um, 
And uh, hopefully we'll be able to build on top of these things with some other data and studies to really, at the end of the day, increase the efficacy that we're seeing uh, with these drugs, but also really circumvent acquired resistance um, as a next step uh, for our patients who need to move on to a next line of therapy. Excellent. Thank you. And that's really quite a nice segue into uh, asking Ross to give us a summary on his, his experience and his presentation while actually using uh, MET inhibitors in the clinic in the context of patients with MET exon 14 skipping mutations. Yeah, thanks. It, that was really a gift, Paul, for you setting me up for that. So I presented a, a case to illustrate a number of different points. So woman in her middle 50s, never smoker, who develops metastatic disease, no brain metast metastases at diagnosis, um, and has a MedExon 14 skip mutation and a PDL1 of 90%. So she goes on uh, MET TKI, has the peripheral edema, and, and, and Paul and I talked about, you know, some of the existing management, also, but also the the theoretical pathophysiology that you get a sort of feedback loop, and part of that feedback loop liberates ligands that cause capillary leak. And Paul certainly has a theory that if we add in an anti-angiogenic, that might suppress things, and that's going on in some ongoing clinical trials now. The patient tolerated the treatment reasonably well, apart from the peripheral edema, but then developed brain metastases, and that opened up the discussion about which of the MET tyrosine kinase inhibitors has good or bad CNS penetration. Obviously, crizotinib very poor, but there is data on both capmatinib and tipotinib having responses in the brain. It's a retrospective analysis, so they tend to have like more patients that have brain metastases than those with measurable brain metastases, but there is some evidence that both of these next generation MET TTIs can have activity in the brain. And then when this patient progressed extracranially, uh, we went, we illustrated the point that she pushed very hard to have immunotherapy and she completely blew through it, despite a PDL one of 90%, no benefit whatsoever. And that kind of picks up on what Paul just said, which is, you know, it's not about the PDL one. It's not just about the MedEx on 14. Maybe smoking status might be the differentiator, you know, that a, a high PDL one in somebody with a reasonable smoking history might mean a lot more in the setting of a MedEx on 14 skip mutation than somebody with a never smoking history. And that's what we kind of use the case to illustrate. But one of the things that we didn't get to talk about that we did sort of uh, cover during the q and A is uh, med amplification in the EGFR acquired resistance setting and whether or not this is something that you're routinely testing for Ross. And if you do detect med amplification in whatever assay you're using, uh, whether or not at this point you're comfortable treating with a med inhibitor or if there are other alternatives to consider um, in these particular cases. So we do re-biopsy for you know, many of the dry oncogenes that have been uh, had a specific targeted therapy, and we do include MET fish testing. And it's interesting you brought it up earlier that the fish testing we think allows us a better call for MET amplification than next generation sequencing because you're amplified relative to something. And in next generation sequencing, Keith, maybe you want to comment on this, it's a bit of a black box because it might vary depending on your assay. Um, so we do MET fish testing. And yes, if we see it, um, we do act on it probably initially by adding in a MET TKI. But, you know, I think some of the MET ADCs are going to be interesting in that setting. So, Keith, I want one issue regarding fish in the acquired resistance setting is we have some data that the level of perceived MET copy number gain in whatever form appears lower than in the, you know, a primary driver state of MET amplification. And, you know, the hypothesis is that it's a subclone. And so your denominator might be all of the cells, not all of which have got acquired resistance. And your numerator is just the acquired resistance ones, which have med amplification. And I really think FISH probably allows you to make that call better than next generation sequencing, which just takes everything together. But what do you think? It would certainly allow you to make that call, provided, of course, that you have uh, a sufficient number of cells to appreciate what might be uh, heterogeneity in uh, the number of copies in particular uh, in you know in individual tumor cells um, you would be relying then on your biopsy having enough um, tumor cells that are accessible but also a reasonable representation of what's in the patient's disease and 
given that I suspect in patients who've got this kind of subclonal heterogeneity, it may be localized within the context of a hundred or a thousand tumor cells, rather than there being an intimate admixture of, of cells with different copy numbers in them. So it might be a bit of blind luck when it comes to the biopsy, but for sure you're not going to get the the kind of averaged assessment that, that you would through NGS. And you know, bearing in mind that NGS doesn't make the distinction between amplification and polysomia. And polysomia is extremely common in lung cancer. And given the fact that we know that with MedX on 14 alterations, we see sometimes phenomenal um, nuclear irregularity. Polysomia, I think, is particularly common in those particular patients. So I would certainly advocate using fish where I could. I think the discussion has pulled this out, that, that fish is kind of the poor man's single cell, you know, testing. In this case, it's still DNA testing, but it provides that level of granularity and um, can then reveal really parts of the heterogeneity of biology that something integrative like NGS really does miss. And I think that's a really important thing to highlight as part of this discussion. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. So I want to thank our audience for listening in and thank you, Keith and Ross, as ever, for joining us and for sharing all of your valuable insights and expertise. It was great speaking with you today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Paul.